Victor, right, I'm Victor Wood, but I usually get called Vic. It was my mother used to call me Victor. And do you come from Canning Street? I come from Croft Street, which is at the Newport, which was at the Newport end of Cannon Street. And uh, I come from the bit. Generally, people would have ca called it Low Croft Street, because Croft Street was intersected by Cannon Street. And the bit from Cannon Street to Newport Road was called High Croft Street, and the bit running up the railway was called Low. And that also applied to Sever Street, which was next to us, and Coop Street, which was next to us, just in the local. Because I once got, uh, when I was at school, St. Paul's, the teacher was going around and asking everybody's address. And I said, 63 Lowcroft Street. And she said to me, when did you move to Laycock Street? Which was on the other side. I said, no, no. And, and she was a sort of an argument. She said, it's only Croft Street. So when you go back, I looked at the sign when I went back, and of course she was right. <laughs> but even now, if you say to people from that end of Cannon Street, you know, I'm from Sever Street, I'm from Cooper Street, low or high. And everybody knew each other as that? Yeah. Just to say. Yeah. And so when you were a kid, did you think that was your address? Yeah. I got a surprise when I looked up at the sign and thought it wasn't. But the funny thing was, next to us going eastwards, it was Welford Street. And then the one running, the continuation of that towards Newport Road was called Disraeli Street. So the high and the low didn't apply there. So when I went back to school the next day, I said to the teacher, why, why is that, why the, the two streets there got different names? And she said, I don't know. And I thought, that was devastating. I thought teachers knew everything. You know, I'd be about seven years old. How is it she didn't know? But I mean, I don't know why. The, they must have run out of names or something. And so I decided just to call the whole street by one name. How long did you live in that area? Well, I was, I was born in... 1943. In 1956, uh, we moved up to Park End, but it was actually my maternal grandparents' house, um, and they moved there around about 1912, because my grand my grandfather was a locomotive driver in the Newport Works, you know, Sammy's Works. Um, my grandmother stayed there when we moved to Park Ed and um, I went back to stay with her quite a, quite a lot. So really, it would be 1963 before I left properly. So, but the, as a family, uh, you know, three generations of us in that one house from 1912 to 1963. And my aunt lived around the corner and my uncle lived around the other street, you know, we were all... I think that happened a lot with the generations of people. Yeah. Well, after the war, uh, housing was short. I mean, uh, I mean, my mother was one of eight. And uh, so we, we lived in. My father worked away a lot, so he wasn't there very often. Um, but my uncle still lived in the house. My grandfather died when I was about two, so I don't really remember him. But there were only two up, two down, and a shed a lean-to shed at the back. So the sleeping arrangements were, my uncle had the back bedroom, my mother had the, the front bedroom with my two sisters. Uh, I went to bed in the back bedroom, in my uncle's bed, and then when it was time for him to come to bed and the whole family went to bed, I was then lifted downstairs and put into a bed with my grandmother, which came out of the sideboard. And uh, that went on for a long time. And the amazing thing is, it was my uncle who used to lift me and carry me downstairs. I never, ever remember waking up when that happened. You know, so that, that, that was until I was about seven or eight years old that that went on. So how many people were living in that house then? Well, at that time, there would be, uh, there was my uncle, um, there was my grandmother, my mother, my two sisters, and me. So, um, but we, it never occurred to us that we were overcrowded or anything like that. You know, it was just, uh, it was just the way of life. I suppose that had happened quite a lot. A lot of people lived in. 
I mean, housing was very, there was a, a real housing shortage. You know, I mean, the people talk about the hard times of the war. Obviously, it was a hard time. People were dropping bombs on you, for one thing. But in, in, in actual fact, life from 1945 for the first couple of years after the war were harder than during the war because food was in shorter supply because the foreign aid, you know, the American aid and Canadian aid stopped in 45. That's why the rationing continued. I mean, I can remember being hungry and my family were not poor as such and they were all, all in work, but nonetheless, food was, uh, was not that, you know, available and you, you didn't waste it and you, you had to ask for permission before you took anything. Uh, was the area bombed a lot in the war? It was just before my time, yeah, Newport got... Actually, uh, Newport, in terms of casualties, it was Ersum and Newport was bombed, the worst bombing raid in Middlesbrough history. Local historians, for some reason, haven't made a lot of it um, because there were no important commercial properties damaged. The, uh, there was a, apparently there was a, a small Methodist chapel at the bottom of Orwell Street, which is just on the other side of Newport Road. That was demolished because the way the bombs came in, one landed on the opposite Archibald School, the recreation ground is, one landed there, killed one man there. Then the second bomb landed between Mill Street and Orwell Street and caused an awful lot of, a lot of casualties there. The third bomb fell on a street called Law Street, <laughs> Law Street Booth Street, and that one fractured a gas main. And the third one, the fourth one fell on open ground. Um, but the, uh, and so when I was a kid, that whole area of Law Street w was empty. It was, it was dead. Like the, the, the houses started sort of halfway down. The, you know, they just cleared it because there was no incentive to rebuild. Because before the war, people knew it was going to be cleared. You know, Hitler held it up a bit. Um, so there was no incentive to build new houses there. And the same if a house was damaged by fire or something. The, they were just owned, the pattern of ownership was you'd get a landlord would own about maybe at the most half a dozen houses. There wasn't a mass landlord. It'd be some middle class family up in Linthorpe or Ackland would just have a few houses. Uh, anything happened to them, they got damaged, they got burnt out. They were left. Uh, and, and, and I remember my childhood, there were several houses where there had been fires and they were just left empty. We always said they were bombed. We called them bombed houses. Of course, they weren't. There was just fire there. But as I say, there was no, no incentive to repair anything. So the, the area was allowed to become derelict. So you say you think that the area was kind of earmarked for them oh, yeah. before the war? Yeah. Uh, the story was, be I know for a fact from McMurray's time, before the war, the idea was that they were going to, and, and everybody was told that they would rebuild. Everybody was told, everybody thought they would rebuild. Um, and the so-called Cannon Street race riots, a lot of that was, some people say that was just the sheer resentment. But the council behaved badly. Local traders got an awful deal. You know, they were, um, you know, the, the whole Cannon Street was shops after, and that uh, bit of Newport Road as well. And they got very little in the way of compensation and they were pressurised and everything, you know, to, uh, to sell below price. The council behaved quite ruthlessly, yeah. Well, do you know what happened to those businesses? Did they open up? Anywhere? Well, no. I mean, a lot of them were, were been there for a long time. They were older. I mean, at the corner of uh, uh, Duncan Barber's, he, he didn't set up again. Good old man. There was a, there was a, a famous shopkeeper called Jackie Nice. Um, and... Uh, one time, they, they did, this is the sort of thing they did. They went in and the council said that uh, this shop has to be closed because it's contravening health things. You know, it's a way to put pressure on him. And he'd taken, very gentle man, but he'd taken a knife and chased this inspector out, apparently. He, was, he ran a photographic studio. He sold general groceries and getting other photographers upstairs. You know, it was a funny area that was. Lots of things going on. Did a lot of people own their own houses there? No. The way they built it up, I mean, you, you'll get uh, mistakes that people say, right, okay, my end of Cannon Street was built for the Newport Ironworks, Sammy's Works particularly. 
uh, Fox Heads was built. That was the bit uh, the, just the other side of the gas tanks between the gas tanks and Marsh Road. It wasn't actually built by the industrialists. They made the land available. And then, as I say, small-scale uh, landlords from the middle-class areas of town would buy a couple of houses and have them built and rent them out. I mean, our, I even remember our landlord's name. He was called Mr Myers. And he lived somewhere up Lin Linthorpe because one time he was ill, and I can remember going with my mother to pay the rent to him, walking up there, yeah. So when people left, did they offer any kind of compensation? No. No. Um, I mean, and, you know, not, no, it's, it's, it's talking about nostalgia. Now, my mother was considerably less nostalgic about it than I was because I was a child and I, I had a doting mother and a doting grandmother to look after me. You know, my mother remembered the hard work of it. And, and she always said, her biggest regret, when they built the Newport Bridge, when they built the approach road, they knocked down half of Samuelson Street and uh, I think it's, what's the, I forgot the name of the street on the other side. And she always said, oh, what a pity. She wanted them to build the bridge further down, <laughs> yeah. take Croft Street out, because those people were uh, rehoused in Ackland Garden City and Winniebanks. And to my mother, Winniebanks was, you know, some sort of green paradise. She would have loved to have moved up there, you know. So she was considerably, you know, it was just for women, the women, Cannes Street women, it was very, very hard work. You know, they are, um, and they're the ones that held everything together, you know. I mean, the men, the men would add hard jobs in the docks and the steel works or wherever. But the men would come home, tea on the table, off to the pub or Sammy's club. But it seemed to me the women just worked all the working hours, you know, and they were very tough women, and very hard women, and they held it together. I always have respect for, you know, the, the gentle sex only exists in Jane Austen novels. There weren't any of them down <laughs> in Cannon Street. <laughs> As I say, the women, women worked very hard. Uh, there was a constant, constant fight against the dirt. And most, the one or two houses stood out where people were scruffy but they took in, 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 in they weren't slums they took immense pride even to the extent of, of cleaning the pavement outside of the house which wasn't actually their responsibility because if you were a kid and you were walking along and, and the housewife had just swilled the pavement and you stepped on it you'd get a flea in your ear i've just swilled that stay off till it's dry so washing day washing must have been a nightmare for them now uh the there were backyards, but there wasn't a lot of room in the backyard. So you strung the washing line over the back alley, which meant you had to have some sort of arrangement with your neighbour from the next street. So that, uh, and you perhaps shared a washing line with them. Um, but uh, so getting clothes dried, I mean, they're not tumble dryers or anything like that. You know, you'd put them on a clothes horse around the fire or what have you. But uh, my father was from uh, Glasgow, from uh, Govan, one of the tenements, and there they used to have a system where they'd have a pulley and put the washing out the window, you know? And so he thought he'd do this. So he put a great big pole on the backyard wall and put a washing line out from the, the back bedroom window. But the unfortunate thing was, one day my mother and my uncle They'd got off, uh, they were walking up H High Sever Street, and because of the gap at the bottom of Low Sever Street, they could see this washing line from some distance, and there was my grandmother's old fashioned bloomers floating high above Newport. <laughs> and uh, my mother was absolutely scandalised, but my uncle said, oh, th What a pity if we thought of that during the war, we could have saved a fortune on Belisha beans. But after that, it came down. <laughs> No more washing up. Because people were very private in that sort of way, you know. And uh, my father put a uh, wireless area across instead. But, um, yeah, j just, as I say, I look at it. I mean, I know that the, how authoritarian my nana was. It, um, the pitch and toss thing. They were playing 
a version of pitch and toss, which is where they threw the coins against the gas tank wall. And I went round there with a friend called David. It'd be about seven. And there was another lad there, Jimmy, who was older. And we said, what are you doing, Jimmy? He says, I'm watching out for the coppers. And they'll give us a few pennies at the end. So we thought, all oh, right, this is important. So we stood watching out for the coppers as well. I got bored and I went home, but I left David there. So I come down and David's house was just whoa, whoa, three houses down from us. And I was just stepping into our house and David's grandmother said, have you seen our David? And I said, he's round the corner where the men are throwing the pennies. We've been watching for the coppers, you know, full of bragado, I see. Somehow or other, my grandmother, as I stepped in, how she did it, I don't know, was behind me the minute I got in the door. Give me such a wallop across the back of the head, I was nearly propelled out of the back door, you know. Don't you go near them again, you'll get put in prison, they'll put you under the town hall clock. And it worked. I never went near them again, you know, because I didn't want to be locked up under the town hall clock. You know, but that's, it was, I mean, it was so straightforward, you know, nobody, I mean, I once got smacked by a policeman. I was um, coming across, you know where the arena is? Well, the pub next to that was the, the, new, uh, the Ackland pub. I was crossing the road there and uh, I ran out before the policeman beckoned me and he just swung me around out of the way of the lorry, took me back to the curb and standing on one leg, put one leg up and put me over it and gave me a good, right hard smack, you know. This was at the lunchtime or dinner time. Now, if I'd gone home and told my nana that I'd been smacked by a policeman, she'd have given me another smack as well, you know, so I just accepted it. But the, the funny thing was I was embarrassed about going back to school past the same policeman. So instead of going over that crossing... I went all the way down towards the Newport Bridge, crossed over there, went the long, longest way around I could find to get to school. So I was late, and there was, a, there was a supply teacher or something, and not my normal teacher, and he said, I've just done the register, hold out your hands, and he went thwack, thwack, with a ruler on both hands. And uh, I always call it Black Thursday, and I remember a friend, Robert Price, saying to me, sit on your hands, sit on your hands. So I sat on my hands, but I could, then I could feel the sore places where the policeman had smacked me, but... It was only a bad day, you know, and it, it got better, you know. It was a Thursday and the Beano was coming out, so I was looking forward to getting home to that. Were there a few women that ran businesses? The, 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 I'll tell you what there were. There were, as well as the set shops, there were called house shops. And it would be, the house would be a, a small business, you know, and there were quite a few of those. Uh, I'm trying to remember her name. She used to run a Annie, Annie Story. She ran a, a little house and she used to sell ginger beer and odd things like that and homemade stuff like that, you know. And there were quite a few of them around. So I've been told there were 60 businesses running on Cannon Yeah, yeah. So how long was Cannon Street? Well, this is it. You know, Cannon Street ran all the way from... Well, you know where the Sainsbury's is now? Cannon Street ran all the way from there to the approach road to the Newport Bridge. This is why people talk about the... Cannon Street community. Now, there wasn't a Cannon Street community. There were several communities, you know, uh, uh, perhaps because of St. Pat's Church, because it was a very strong Catholic presence there, there was a certain unity among the Catholic community. But, I mean, my horizons were the gas tanks on one side, the Newport Bridge approach road on the other side, you know, that, that was my world. The, the, the other end of Cannon Street to me was not that familiar. And so, I, yeah. Was there any rivalry between the two ends? Not really. The, the thing was, Foxheads, had a, the kids there had a terrible reputation for being really tough, rough, you know, rougher than the rest of us. And uh, I remember one time there was a, a, an open piece of land between Cooper Street and the, the Bridge Approach Road, which we called Cooper Common, but other people had different names for it. And we were building a bonfire there, and that'd be about seven or eight. And the other lad said, right, you, you guard the bonfire in case the fox headers come. And went off and left me, and I'm standing there. So if the fox headers, <laughs> I'll tell you now, if the fox headers had come, I'd have been across the Newport Bridge on the other side of the river. You know, fortunately, they didn't turn up, but... Yeah, there, no, there wasn't any. 
I mean, with the adults as well, I suppose my uncle and that, they, they, they would perhaps go to the pubs at the other end as well. Although the pubs which served our end were the Acklam and the Newport Hotel were the main ones, and Sammy's Club on the bottom of Parliament Road. So what's your fondest memory of what's been living in there anyway? I know, just the um, absolute security of it, you know. I mean, you were just about to tell us about your memories, one of the, your memories of the smell of the place. The, the, the smoke, the, 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 the pervasive, if I was to remember the smell of the place, it would be the smell of the river. Spent a lot of time by the river, playing. We, we couldn't get down our side of the river. The Newport Bridge was an adventure playground for us. You know, um, we used to play on it, climb on it, and uh, a fellow used to come and chase us, called him the bridge, watch out the bridge, God, she's coming, you know, and we'd all run. Um, we could stand there and watch the ships go by, you know, and we played on the, where Billingham Beck comes in, we used to play there. I wasn't supposed to, I was not supposed to play there, but that's the smell. I remember I fell down the embankment once, split my head open. Friends took me home and said, don't tell, don't tell me, Mum, I was down by the river, don't, to, you know. So I um, said I'd fallen just around the corner, but anyway, she walked me along to the North Ryden Infirmary. And it must, I think it was a foreign doctor who said to me, where did you do this? So I thought, I'd better tell the truth, the doctor. I said, I, I, I was playing by the river and I fell down the river. He said, did you touch the water? And I said, no, no. I said, um, even so, we'll have to watch him for concussion. So until I was about 13, I thought concussion was a disease you got from falling in the river. <laughs> I had no idea what it was. You don't think when you're a kid, you know. Um, played by the river an awful lot. That was a, you know. And then, of course, I read uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, and I had visions of sailing down the Tees on a raft and all sorts, you know. It was a, it was a, it was a good... There were some good play areas there. You know, Billingham Beck was within walking distance. What's it, uh, used to catch fish there and things, you know. Um, you were talking about um, something to do with lavender soap. Oh, yeah. The women had... No, lavender polish. There was a set routine in our house, and Friday was always furniture polishing day, so we'd come back from school, and it'd be lavender wax polish, you know, and there was always that lovely smell. I always associate that smell with Fridays because they did set things there was a washing day there was a you know a, a, a furniture polishing day there'd be a, a bed making day you know it was all I think the only way to cope with such drudgery is is to routinize it you know so that um, you, you don't forget to do anything if it's if you've got a set routine for doing it and it was a battle to keep, uh, you know, overcrowded houses and uh, um, dirt outside. And, you know, he had a bath, the bungalow back on the wall. He had a bath and then that water would be used then to swill the backyard or swill the step or the, the post tub in the backyard. You know, I mean, there's just on Seventh Street, in this side, I remember she was called Mrs. Knight. And she used to, her wash day, I think it must have been about a Tuesday or something, she would stand in the backyard in her bare feet, November, December, January, snow, whatever, and she'd be pussing away, and she used to sing one song all the time, Moonlight and Roses, that's all she ever sung. But that's the sort of women there were there, you know, tough, as I say, not the gentle sex at all, hard. And do you think it was women that kept the area together? Yeah, women always do. Women kept the community together, yeah. W women, uh, women, women are more social animals than we are. The, the women set greater store by social ties and than men do on the whole. See, the men... There was strong bondship between the men, you know, workmates and things like that. And uh, But, the, yeah, it's the women who... I mean, there's the picture there, a woman scrubbing the, scrubbing the pavement. What, what kind of social outlets did women have? Because men have got the pubs and they've got social Well, there, there was, sometimes the women would go at the pubs. I mean, the, the, you couldn't go at the Acklam. Acklam was totally men only. But the Newport had a, I mean, in the old days, you used to have the, the bar, which was men only. And then you'd have the snug, which tended to be women only. And then you'd have the lounge where women would go as well. I, I remember my mother and 
father going there and going along, there was the, the pictures, and going along to the wrestling at Farris Street. I remember going to that. And the uh, wrestler, my hero was a wrestler called Dirty Dick Swirls. <laughs> that was a, uh, there was pl there's plenty to do, you know. There was plenty of entertainment, a lot of places to play. It wasn't, no way did I have a deprived childhood. No way whatsoever. I had a very, I was very lucky. I was born at a good time. Uh, the welfare state had just come in, you know, and uh, they were insistent on, you know, uh, what, a third of all the men that they recruited in the war were suffering from malnutrition and rickets and things. Stop that happening, uh, certainly in Middlesbrough, when I was an infant, we had to drink a foul mixture of orange juice and cod liver oil, you know, vitamin C and vitamin D. Dreadful stuff, and you weren't allowed not to drink it. You weren't allowed to say, I don't like orange juice. Be some be behind you ready with a hand to give you, drink it. <laughs> and, you know, that's the way they thought to, to, to try and make you healthy and all that. There was an emphasis, you know, there was a whole sea change in the war that um, we could not go back to the what had gone before in the 30s. So, and 1944 Education Act liberated people like me. I mean, all my uncles and aunts and my mother all very, very intelligent people, great readers, but none of them had the chance to go to grammar school or anything in the 30s. Me, 1944 Education Act, and, you know, people in my class, you know, I, I mean, I know it created grammar schools and there's a lot of controversy about that, but um, it gave people like me the chance to go to the likes of Ackland Hall, and which mm -hmm. I'd have had a completely different life if I hadn't gone there. You know, so I think I was born at a good time, looking at what's happening to the world now. I went to a lovely school. I went to St. Paul's School, which when I went to it, it had been originally attached to the church, but it was bombed. And they actually moved it into what, what had been a deserted end of Newport Road Schools between um, Victoria Street and uh, Greta Street, just at the back of where the arena is now. And I was just... It was funny, I was just talking um, not so long back. If, if your house caught fire, wh which book would you save? And I've got this book, it's called The Roads to Dreamland, and it was awarded to me for full attendance and punctuality in years 1951 to 1952 by St. Paul's School. And I keep that in mind, because <laughs> it was really, I just remember a very happy existence. But then I didn't have to contend with the dirt. I, I was one of the things that had to be kept clean. You know what I mean? And I remember playing on the, uh, playing on one side of the street in the morning and the sun shone out and then we moved on to the other side when the, the sun went around the other side and just generally happy, lots of street games, you know, uh, lots of friends. Um, just a totally non-anxious life. Mm. Playing <coughs> by the river. Down by the river. You were saying uh, you didn't have to contend with the dirt, but you, where did all the dirt come from? Well, it was, oh, I should get you some photographs. It was just uh, the, the amount of soot falling. And people think of it uh, because of the ironworks, and it, 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 obviously they did contribute, but mostly it was domestic fuel. Um, I've got a photograph uh, taken from the top of St. Columbus Church looking down Cancer, and you can see it's just full of smoke. Um, because the thing was, particularly after the war, um, there was only rubbishy coal available for domestic use because Britain was in such debt, all the good coal was saved for export, you know, to try and, and so the household coal was rubbish, gave off more smoke than flames, so you got all these chimneys going. So a lot of it was domestic. So the Clean Air Act in the late 1950s would clean it all up, I suppose. Yeah, it was, uh, my uncle, one of my uncles said, oh, yeah, I, I interviewed him because I ran a site on uh, Newport and I interviewed him and I said to him, the same question you've asked me, what do you miss about Cannon Street? And he, quite a humorous man, he said, yeah, well, I miss waking up in the morning and listening to the sparrows coughing, sitting of an evening and watching the gas tanks setting in the sun, you know, that was his memory of it.
Yeah, it was just a nice... I mean, I suppose for me what happened then, I, I passed the, the 11 plus, I went to Ackland Hall School, which I found incredibly strict and severe after my cosy little, you know. Uh, at the same time, we moved up to Park End, so I lost... I was the only one who went to Ackland Hall, so I lost, uh, I lost all my school friends, I lost all my street friends, you know, it was... So it's quite a... 1955, 1956 was quite a momentous time for me. But as I say, I drifted back. I found, when I was at Ackland Hall and we lived at Park End, I had to get two buses to get from Park End to Ackland, and I was always late. If the Smeaton Street crossing at North Ormsby closed, I was late. And I got punished, I got punished for being late over and over and over again. So in fact, during the week, it was easier to go and live back with my grandmother. Because I could get the airbus then and, and get to school on time, yeah. And did you keep in touch with people after that? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's still one or two. Uh, I've got a friend called Barry Seymour, who uh, one of my oldest friends, a school friend. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't remember, one or two, yeah, and families. It, actually, the uh, Scarlet site is, it's not just... Cannon Street revisited, it's Cannon Street reunited. We are finding a lot of people that we knew, or I didn't know you, but oh, I remember your brother, or I remember your uncle, or whatever, you know. We, we do have a sense of belonging there. I, I as I said, I, I do talks to various groups, I do a talk on dialect, and I always say where I came from. And you can bet everywhere I go, whether it's Stockton, Darling, uh, and I say I was from the Cannon Street area, somebody at the end will come up and say, I'm from there as well. It's almost like a, like there was an exodus, you know? Uh, because when you think, there were thousands and thousands of families there. You know, say Denmark Street, the addresses ran up to something like 120. I mean, we were halfway up Low Croft Street, and our number was 63. So, you know, there, there would be 100 houses there in that, in that one street. Um, so it was quite a sizeable community, quite a sizeable part of the town. So obviously as a kid you, you've got kind of very fond memories of it and uh, but what about adults that were moving out when they, when they were being up in the first town? How did they feel? Did you know? Well my mother was thrilled skinny about getting this house in Park End but uh, some people were, un were very unhappy um, as I say, they, they were misled. They had thought that they would rebuild. I mean, the, the, ju the Max Lock justification for not rebuilding was because of the, what you mentioned, the pollution. But in fact, with the Clean Air Act and the fact that the, the, the Iron Masters District, there are no iron works there now. Uh, if you go down there now on a, a summer's day, there's a clear blue sky. If you walk by the river, it would make a fantastic residential area that now. Mm. You know. I always say I dream of winning the lottery and I'd buy up all those business estates and I'd get rid of them <laughs> and put social housing back there, you know, affordable social housing. Keep the terraces. Nothing wrong with terraces, you know. There's, there was this prejudice about ter terrace house is it's more efficient energy wise, a lot harder to break into. Nothing wrong with a grid pattern either. Easier to find your way around a grid pattern. Um, you know, re uh, I, I remember, I don't ever remember being cold in Croft Street. It was a warm house. One coal fire, it was a warm house. Went to Park End, semi-detached house. No proper insulation. Metal frames to conduct the heat out. And we moved in there February 1956. And I, that was the first time I was ever cold in bed, ever. Not in Croft Street, I wasn't. Our house was a matriarchy and my nana was the... There were two ways of doing things. My nana's way and the wrong way, you know. And uh, I remember there was a pitch, the men used to play pitch and toss, which was illegal. And the police could find any number of police to raid these things. But um, I was, uh, as a kid, I was in a swing, a canvas swing on the backyard door. And they were playing pitch and toss at the bottom. There was a gap between Sever Street and Croft Street. And they were playing pitch and toss. And the police raided it. Our backyard door was open. This man came running up, ran into our backyard, sent me flying out the swing, 
That bit I remember because I was quite young. And then he hid in our outside lavatory. The policeman came running after him and my grandmother wouldn't let him in. Wouldn't let the policeman in. The dog was barking at the lavatory so the policeman knew there was somebody in there. She wouldn't let him in at all. Go away and get a search warrant and then you can... So he gave up and went away. And this man came out and said to me, said to me Oh, thanks a lot, missus. So then she smacked him about the head and threw him out the front door. That's for knocking the bear out of the swing. You know, that was the sort of people you had. Wonderful people, wonderful characters. You know, it was... Um, as I say, I have nothing but... Uh, I, I look at it through rose-coloured spectacles, probably, to be quite honest, you know. I mean, life was, wasn't hard for me, but it was hard for my mother and her brothers and her sisters, you know, and my nana. It was hard for them, but it wasn't hard for me. I had a cosseted life. Mm. Did your mum tell you that it was hard for her? Yeah. My mum worked in... Uh, I think the thing with my, my mum, what it was... I didn't know anything else. You remember, I, I, I was, I was just saying to somebody, I didn't know much about the rest of Middlesbrough until I was in my teens. I had no reason to go out of that area because it was self-contained. Like over the border would be self-contained, the Thornsby would be self-contained. But my mother worked in service in, uh, up on, which was Grange Road, houses up there. And she saw how the other half lived. And, uh, and it always made her, she was aware that, you know, other people were better off, you know. I, I it didn't come home to me till when I went to Appermore, of all a teacher who was lecturing us, didn't believe in universal suffrage, history teacher. And he said to us, well, not everybody should be allowed to vote because not everybody walking on two legs is a human being. If you don't believe me, take a walk down Cannon Street someday. And that's the first time I ever realised that I came from somewhere that other people looked down on, you know. You know, quintessential English vice of snobbery. Still hate it. Do you, do you think people did look down on you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, you, you get people... Now, people say it was... It, 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 it wasn't rough. I... The uncle who lived in the house, he moved... He, when he got married, he moved to North Road, you know, just over the border. And, I mean, I absolutely loved him to bits, this uncle. Now, my father was away a lot. And, I mean, this uncle, he, he just was, he was so funny. He was just, that's the one who said about the gas tanks, you know. He's a, I mean, I remember another uncle saying um, that two-thirds of the world's spiders live in Australia. And the, uncle, the other uncle said, aye, and the other third live in our lavvy, which was true. <laughs> but um, I used to go, I, I missed him when he moved out. And I'd, be, I'd be about seven or eight when he moved out. And he, he, he worked for a, a fish place over the, uh, just over the border. And when I was six or seven, I could walk all the way from the Newport end, all the way down Cannon Street, up Marsh Street, along Marsh Road, underneath the tunnel at Denmark Street, which is still there, onto North Road, and back in the dark. And there was never, never a thought that I was in any danger at all. It just... It just not, was not a lawless area at all. There'd be some pub fights and things, but uh, they didn't send for the policeman. They, they sent for the priest, and he would sh stop them, you know. 